All right, I think uh, we are ready here. Um, I'm surprised we have this many people. It's such a boring topic. <laughs> you never know, right? Uh, anyway, um, my name is David Johnson. I am the executive director for the Center of Ethics and the Rule of Law here at the University of Pennsylvania. And we are in the beautiful uh, Annenberg Public Policy Center. And we thank them for uh, allowing us to use this beautiful space for these events. Um, a little bit about Searle. Um, it is the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. It's a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting ethics and the rule of law in national security, warfare, and democratic governments. Um, affiliated with the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, Searle draws from the study of law, philosophy, ethics, to uh, answer difficult questions that arise in times of war and contemporary transnational conflicts. Searle brings together scholars, policymakers, professionals across the legal, military, intelligence, and business sectors to research, analyze, and make policy recommendations that address today's challenging issues such as domestic violent extremism, the use of autonomous weapons, the protection of civilians in war zones. Searle carries out its mission through conferences, symposia, research, policy papers, briefing, blog publishing, student projects, and other activities. Um, each summer, for your students here, we host an internship class of uh, largely graduate students and some extraordinary undergraduate students. And uh, I welcome any students um, to apply for that. It's a fantastic program. And I'm not just saying that because I'm going to be running it this summer. It is a wonderful program. Um, Searle was founded in 2012 by uh, the moderator here, Prefer, uh, Professor uh, Claire Finkelstein, who is um, a professor at the law school and the founding director of Searle and its faculty director. And as I often like to tell people, uh, Searle would not exist but for Claire's indomitable will and uh, ability to draw in interesting people. So Claire, off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. And is this working? Yes, I think it is. Well, um, if I look a little tired, it's because um, I have not been able to put this book down since I started reading it. So I had a few late nights this week finishing it. It is an incredible page turner. Um, and it reads, it reads like a movie. And the scenes, I feel like I've been watching a movie reading this book. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a dramatic conversation and, and all the things. Um, I've had this wonderful opportunity to get to know David in preparation for today. Um, uh, and I know it's going to be a fascinating conversation. But let me first introduce uh, David Phillips. So um, uh, David Phillips is an award-winning national correspondent for the New York Times, where he writes about the military. His work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Seattle Times, among other publications, in addition to the New York Times. His military coverage won a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. And he was twice named a Pulitzer finalist for local reporting and for breaking news. His coverage of the violence at Fort Carson in the Colorado Springs Gazette won the Livingston Award. And his book, Lethal Warriors, won honorable mention for the J. Anthony Lucas Prize. He lives in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and was kind enough to fly in for this event. Uh, so David, thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much for writing this incredible, incredible book. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really thrilled. I want to begin by just asking the standard question, you know, why you wrote the book, but I have to say, you've never served in the military. Right, so. so uh, why? Why do you, why, what brought you to write about the military and then why Eddie Gallagher in particular? So I, uh, I used to start by saying, I used to answer that question by saying that I went to J school and the first day of J school was uh, in New York was when the towers got attacked. Uh, but I realized that it went back farther than that. So I grew up in Colorado Springs, which is a big military town. We've got the Air Force Academy there. We've got a big army base. And when I was going to public school there, probably a third or maybe a half of the, the kids that I was in class with were army brats. And so to me, the military was not something exotic or something that was in movies or something that, that had to do with war overseas. It was my neighbors, uh, my friends. Um, people that I would see all over the place. Uh, when I became a, a journalist at the newspaper in Colorado Springs, I started there in 2002. 
Um, uh, all of a sudden, my friends and neighbors, all these people that had been around me in uniform all my life were deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan and then coming back and then deploying to Afghanistan and coming back and then deploying again and coming back. And we really started to see uh, an impact at home of those wars that, that you know, was very far away from the conflict zone, but very real. And so I think because I had had that, that experience of seeing um, people in uniform you know, as not any different from me, that I just, you know, I decided to write about them, or didn't decide, it was just a natural instinct, write about these folks as people, as your neighbors, as people that you talk to at, at barbecues down the block. And what's happening to them at work? What's happening to them uh, with their families when they come home? What's happening to them with their uh, boss, their employer? You know, if you start looking at them as more normal people and, and not um, someone that you just say thank you to uh, for your service to once a year, um, I think that, inevitably, you'd start doing the stories that I do, which are all very, like, uh, human-focused. I like to say, like, I, just to sound, like, snobby for a sec, I get to go to awards things, and people give me awards, and they say, wow, how do you do this? And I say, all I do is I find Joes, and I talk to Joes. And I, you know, then I tell you what the Joes said. That's all I do. Um, and so this is very much a story of a couple of Joes who were put in a really unusual impossible situation and, and how they reacted. So and we'll get into it um, in, in the question period, um, perhaps, that those of you who, are, who have been in the military uh, and who have read the book might comment on, on whether or not you've captured the lingo. But to me, I feel like I was there reading your book. So you really have seemed to imbibe the culture, and it puts you inside in a way that not a lot of um, military writers have, have captured, I think. So let's begin by t reminding our audience of Eddie's story. If you could just narrate it, walk, th walk us through from when, you know, the major turning points in his career when he first joined the SEALs sure. to when, on the other end of the story, he's shaking President Trump's hand at Mar-a-Lago, giving right. him a gift, right, and, um, of course, getting his sentence commuted. So Eddie Gallagher is, is, in a lot of ways, a very normal guy who's, his whole adult life was basically the war on terror. Uh, he joined um, the Navy in 1999 uh, as a corpsman, a medic, uh, and he uh, deployed to Iraq when we invaded Iraq in 2003. He then became a SEAL in 2005. He went to Afghanistan in 2006. Uh, he went back to Afghanistan again in 2008. Um, then he came back and trained SEALs in California, then he became a chief, the head of a platoon. So he's slowly going up the, the uh, professional ladder of a very elite group, um, the Navy SEALs. Uh, at the same time, you know, the, the wars that, that he's involved with and has been involved with for a long time, they're reaching like very unsatisfying ends. You know, we leave Iraq having... Um, not really achieved a lot of what we wanted to. We're still in Afghanistan at that point. Um, uh, but, you know, the uh, warfare is at a much lower level where guys like Eddie don't necessarily get involved too much anymore. Um, so he's reached the height of his career at the end of two wars where I think he doesn't really know what to think of it. And then he... Um, uh, gets put in charge of a, a platoon that goes to, is selected to go to Mosul, Iraq, where ISIS has taken over. And their job is to work with Iraqi forces to take the city back from ISIS. And in a way, ISIS is what he's been looking for his whole career. Uh, here's the people that embody the extremism and the violence that he was, was trying to uh, you know, contradict in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they're actually going to stand and fight. They're holding terrain they are uh, identifiable combatants, which is exactly like what a guy like him and the rest of the SEALs that he was leading uh, wanted, a fair fight uh, against an identifiable enemy. Um, and they get to Mosul and realize that it's much more complex and still not what he wanted. But uh, there he decides that even though the fight is still ambiguous, uh, even though the rules of engagement are still not as free as he would hope, he, he's going to take the fight to, to you know, the enemy that he sees in front of him. Um, and 
I have to say that we have to rely a lot on the, what the guys in his platoon say because he denies that any of this happened. But um, what the guys in his platoon say is that when he got to Iraq, uh, he started sort of indiscriminately shooting anyone he could, kids, uh, old people, unarmed people, women. Um, and then uh, there was a point where they took charge of a, they took um, a detainee. I, I, we had a discussion. He's not a prisoner of war. He's a detainee. They had a, a detainee ISIS fighter that was brought to them. And uh, what the guys in the platoon say is that essentially the, uh, their chief, their boss, the guy in charge, uh, stabbed this, this young fighter in the neck and killed him in front of them. Um, and then afterwards, he lined everyone up together, and they took pictures with this dead body. And, and um, uh, Eddie Gallagher, the chief, then texted some of these photos to some of his friends back home, saying, effectively, like, check this out. This was cool. Um, later, after this deployment, which fell apart in other ways, where the guys really started to doubt the leadership of their chief, um, they turned him in. They turned him into the Navy SEALs. He was charged with murder um, by the Navy. Uh, he went to uh, trial in 2019. Uh, and after a trial of about two weeks, he was acquitted. Um, so these guys who had had from his platoon, who had done something very difficult, um, made a choice between should we be loyal to our culture, our organization, our brotherhood, or should we be loyal to the rule of law, which sounds like it's simple, but it's not. Um, uh, they watched this, this trial fall apart, and, and this guy who they say they watched murder multiple people walk free. Um, at the same time, this became sort of a cause celeb of uh, conservative cable media. Uh, the idea that uh, the military, the deep state, would punish uh, one of its its war fighters for killing uh, an ISIS combatant to them just seemed absurd. Uh, and they couldn't believe that he was going to trial and pushed for President Trump to do something. And President Trump um, said that he would do something. Uh, ultimately, Eddie Gallagher was acquitted. So we will never know if Eddie... If, of murder. Of murder. Um, so we'll never so know if... convicted of... Something very, very, very minor small. Minor taking pictures with uh, Yeah, taking body. pictures with right. a dead body. Exactly. Um, exactly. So, so we'll never know how much the president would have gotten involved, but, but he really held Eddie up as a um, kind of a wedge issue, you know, in the same way that, that um, you know, critical race theory or... Uh, transgender bathrooms or like something else that's, that's really complex and maybe not even a thing um, uh, is a wedge issue. Right. All of a sudden, Eddie right. Gallagher and should he be prosecuted for killing a terrorist became a wedge issue. Becomes a wedge issue. And then, and so we'll, we'll go to that story after we, mm. after we cover more about his story and about the SEALs. So one of the things that you describe so well in the book is this kind of SEAL culture, um, this you know, very aggressive culture focused on machismo, not so concerned about the details of the rules at all times. Um, and you trace this back to Vietnam. It's really fascinating, this discussion coming out of Vietnam of the guys putting green paint on their faces and um, you know, ripping off insignia, kind of bending the rules in a lot of places and, and being told that they can be creative, right? And, and so you paint him as part of a lingering, somewhat lawless culture compared to regular enlisted. I want to be really careful to say yeah. that I think it's a subculture. It's a subculture. So tell us um, a little bit about that. You know, and because the pirates. And the pirates. There, there's like a... Within the SEALs for, I think, a long time, there's been a, a real push-pull over what is special operations and what does that mean, how should you, how should you approach that? Um, and there's some people who, who think, like, hey, like what it means is, is the rules don't necessarily apply to us. You know, we have a dirty job to do, and you're not going to catch devils with angels type of thing. Um, and, and there's other people that just don't buy that at all, and, and they see 
uh, that type of work where you're you're really doing very difficult missions and very violent missions as not being the absence of ethics, but being like uh, a need for an extra level of ethics. And those two groups have clashed. Um, uh, the the group that thinks like, hey, the rules don't necessarily apply. Um, uh, I called them in the book the pirates. I don't think that most seals call themselves that, but there certainly is a, a subculture there. Uh, and I called the other group the good guys the Boy Scouts. And let me tell you, the, the good guys definitely don't call themselves the Boy Scouts. They hate that name. <laughs> right. But anyway, um, yeah. so let me talk to you about where I think it comes from. Um, and I should be careful because I think there's a, a couple uh, people who were in the seals in the, in the audience. So like, I may get it wrong. but. The best that I can tell um, is that, like, here, here's a very small group of people that was, was essentially said, like, hey, you're going to do special unconventional warfare. And to do unconventional warfare, you need to be creative, unconventional, do things like beyond what the book says. In fact, invent chapters that weren't even in the book, because that's how we win. You expect the enemy to play by the rule book? Of course you don't. So uh, let's, let's bring it to them. Um, and that mindset was was paired with something else. For for generations, the seals um, deployed in very very small groups, maybe a group of like 30, 40 guys. So unlike an army battalion or a marine battalion, there's very little there in terms of um, oversight. You know, the the highest ranking person there might be uh, an O3, like a very junior officer. Um, and so that led to sort of like them making their own culture without a, a general there to say, don't do that, or, or a colonel even, uh, or a captain, I guess, since they're, they're the Navy. So, um, so in Vietnam, they are, they're sort of given this part of the Mekong Delta and said, find insurgents here and, and take care of them. And what they decided to do was a bunch of like, basically ambush and terror tactics where they started wearing like civilian clothes and then at some points were not even wearing shoes, um, yeah, using weird weapons and, and knives and even crossbows. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes like purposefully terrorizing uh, uh, villages so that they would, would um, give up who, was, who there was really an enemy. Um, and those folks, like if you were involved in that and you didn't have a taste for it, um, you got out of the Navy. You know, you came back from Vietnam and would say, like, thank you very much, but I don't want to uh, kill a, a village leader with a knife in the middle of the night and then paint his face green so the villagers know we did it. Thank you, but that's not my thing. So you would leave the Navy. The guys who thought that was kind of effective, they would stay in the Navy, right? And so... During the, the 70s and even into the, the late 80s, like a lot of those or guys. In the seals, stay in the yeah, seals. sorry, that you would stay in the not. seals. And so yeah. in the 70s and 80s, um, those guys stayed in the, the Navy SEALs and really started to create the culture. And it was a, a culture that, to a certain extent, like um, uh, glorified the fact that they were a little bit outlaw, that they didn't necessarily like have to follow the rules. There's a saying in the SEALs, I don't know when they all learn it, and I don't think it's in the official doc doctrine, but if you, if you go to uh, the SEAL base at Coronado and you talk to the youngest uh, SEALs there, they already know it. So you say, the, uh, you say, if you ain't cheating, and they know how to, they know how to finish it. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. <laughs> Just like a... a, a a thing, and I gotta say, like this is not across the board. Um, there are seals with like uh, that I've met that are certainly like amazing human beings and and just like amazing stores of of ethics. But there's also a culture there, and if you want it, you'll find it that says like ah, the rules don't apply to us. Um, there are people out there that just need killing, and if the rules say that you can't do it, you don't need to follow the rules. Well, and doesn't that, in some sense, right? I mean, fighting the Viet Cong, right? The country was suddenly fighting fighting this enemy unlike prior wars, right? Where we're suddenly fighting this guerrilla war mm -hmm. um, in a population that we don't understand 
according to rules we don't understand. And, and then you flash forward to the war on terror, and it's sort of the same thing again, right? And so in some way, this what you're describing as, as SEAL culture um, does characterize the country a little bit around fighting war on terror, right? We, you know, the center has focused a lot mm. on changes in the Office of Legal Counsel memos, um, a legal structure that says, you know, when you're fighting Al-Qaeda, when you're fighting ISIS, they don't follow the rules, so why should we? And I, th I think that the, the culture in Vietnam that was paced down, passed down was very much a culture that formed in reaction to that idea that, like, the bad guys are out there somewhere, but we don't know who they are, and they're not going to tell us, and therefore, like, we can't do conventional warfare by the old rules. Like, this isn't going to be a World War II type of situation. And, and so, because they'll use the rules against us, right? right? Absolutely. Like dealing with an enemy like the Viet Cong, yeah. dealing with an enemy like ISIS. And the, and the same thing happened in them. Iraq and Afghanistan. Like, they know if they pick up a, a rifle, they'll get shot. So they changed their weapons and their tactics right. to, uh, so no one's armed, no one's attacking you, and yet every time you, you drive into town, you get blown up. Um, and so we're, sta we're, we're, at, we're at an interesting point of a sort of ethical crossroads here, right? Because the work of the center, the work that we do here, is to try to make the case that, you know, a strong national defense depends upon a rule of law culture, mm. right? That, that we do best when we follow the rules. And, and here we had the situation in which there was a lot of, encouragement to violate the rules, to get creative, as you suggest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and may have produced someone like Eddie Gallagher. One of the, the confusing things about his story is you talk about how he turned Alpha Platoon around, right? They became this sort of lean, mean fighting machine, um, went from a kind of scraggly bunch of guys who couldn't quite get it together, might be individually very strong, but they weren't well coordinated, they weren't... Um, and so how do we understand his effectiveness as a leader in making Alpha Platoon strong as he did, given what then happened? Is this a story of someone who is decompensating as the story progresses? Or is it the same person and different aspects of him? in different situations. So one of the interesting things about Eddie Gallagher is he, everybody who met him liked him. And I'm sure that all of us have met this person in their life. Everyone who met him liked him, but the longer you got to know him, the, the less you liked him. And he was extremely motivating to this group of guys because he really wanted to be the best chief in the West Coast SEALs. He knew that if he was the best chief of the best platoon, uh, he would get the most plum assignment. And in, in the SEALs, to get the, the best assignment means you're going to the worst place. It's like a contradiction, right? Like, the worst assignment would be if you, like, got sent to, like, Guam or something and, like, sat on the beach and it was quiet and nice and no one got hurt. The best assignment you can possibly get is to go to the middle of Mosul and, and um, right. just see a ton of, of action. So he wanted that really bad. And, and he was very good at... at um, uh, being like a father figure to his guys. Hey, you know what? I'm going to get you into the best schools. You want to get to the sniper school? No problem. You want to get to the combat driving school? No problem. I've got connections where we're, we can cut the line for you a little bit there. We're going to do all these workarounds so that we can get position ourselves to be the best so we can get that assignment. And they were all very motivated guys. That's what they wanted to do. Um, you know, These were guys who were in their early 20s and were Navy SEALs, and they had a chance to fight ISIS. It is exactly what they wanted to do. Um, but when they got into Iraq is when things changed for them. Because I think that they started to realize that what their chief wanted to do had nothing to do with um, you know, like strategic impact, defeating the enemy. And it was, it was more about, to like bring back a term from Vietnam, about getting some, like to uh, uh, how could he bring home some experiences back to the, the base in California that would help him um, in the pecking order that is the SEALs? And that seems weird, right? Because like us in the civilian world, we think like, wow, Navy SEAL, like that already, just that label, 
is uh, carries with it extreme prestige. It's very and elite. discipline, right? The epitome yeah. of discipline. Um, right. So, but and, and here you have the set. You described the second in command has to run the platoon. Right. Because Gallagher's up on a roof. Right. Shooting at the air. So, so the interesting thing about like the Navy SEAL world from the inside versus the outside is once you get into the Navy SEAL world, everyone's a Navy SEAL. And so you being a Navy SEAL doesn't count for anything at all. And then there's all sorts of little pecking order things that will make you count more than someone else. Um, you know, and since these guys, their chosen profession is warfare, warfare counts a great deal towards like how much you count. Um, not across the board, but certainly within certain subcultures. Um, and so if you've deployed, you count more than if you haven't. If you've deployed to a place where you actually saw combat, you count more than if you haven't. If you've really done some incredible stuff while you were uh, in combat, that counts even more. And so when Eddie Gallagher was, was doing this stuff, um, she, so I haven't even talked about what he was doing, but uh, he, he would set up in sniper hides and, and just, um, you know, shoot at random people, pretty much whoever he could see. He was trying to, or at least his, his men perceived that he was trying to up his kill count. Um, to be able to say, yeah, I came back and I killed 20 guys from ISIS, 30 guys from ISIS. That would matter in his pirate subculture. Um, and then when this uh, captive was brought to them, this ISIS guy, and I've got a set of uh, image for you guys so you can see how pathetic this is. When they bring this, this captive in, he's not one of these wild, bearded, uh, really combative enemies that, that probably have grown in the imag imagination of a lot of Americans. He's a 17-year-old kid. Uh, he probably weighs about 120 pounds. Uh, and he's been dragged out of a building that's been hit by a missile, and so he's barely conscious. Um, so Eddie Gallagher kills this guy with a knife. Um, and that's very important to him because a knife kill is gives you more cred than a regular kill. To kill someone with a gun is kind of anodyne. To, to have the, the, the grit and skill to do it up close with a knife, and by the way, in this story, he doesn't mention that it's a teenager who can't move, is a great story and something that will be passed around at the base in California. And so that's the only reason that his men could try and like logically understand like why did did our chief just do this in front of us? Why did he just kill this guy? Uh, and then have us take pictures with him and then tell his friends about it. You know, that was for them, it was the only thing that made sense. And honestly, to them, it still didn't make sense. So, so when I first heard his story, before I had read your book, I thought, so this is a classic PTSD case, right? He was deployed in Afghanistan. He, he had PTSD and he progressed, and he was, you know, a, a great, leader, he turned this platoon around, then slowly started to decompensate. And, and, and when I presented that to you when we were uh, talking uh, the other day, you said, well, his wife insists he did not have PTSD. Yeah, I thought, so I thought the same thing. I was yeah. like, this guy, all I know, when I first heard about it, all I know is 38-year-old SEAL chief, multiple deployments, Ron Starr gets arrested. And I was like, well, okay, that means he's been in for years. And in the SEALs, that means he's done a bunch of deployments. Probably he got reached his limit and, and did something overseas where he lost it. Because if you, if you don't have the self-control uh, on deployments to, and you're just going to do something like kill a captive, that's usually like a young, young person mistake that you make early in the military. Not that it happens all the time, but, it, you know, you wouldn't get to be a chief if that was something exactly. you were going to do. So I was exactly. like, okay, something changed. Something happened. That. That, that cracked. So I, the first thing I did is I called his wife because a lot of times um, family is going to notice first if, if someone's falling apart. A lot of times you can hold it together better at work than you can at home. And I talked to her and... Um, first, I started just asking her a little bit about his service because I didn't want to say, like, so do you think he had PTSD? Uh, uh, and, you know, when did he deploy? Where? What did he say that was like? Was he ever uh, in any um, roadside bomb blast? Did he ever have friends die? And she's like, no, no, no. Like, it was not checking any of the boxes of, like, here's a guy who had seen a lot of combat. And so I was like, you know, did he come back different this time? Did he seem more 
uh, you know, was he having trouble sleeping? Did he seem more angry? Anything? She's like, and she got what I was asking. And she, uh, she's like, no, this is not, he didn't have PTSD. He was um, better than ever after this, this, uh, this deployment. That's not what this story is about. This story is about how his guys, and she said, forgive me, because I'm about to offend everybody in the room, but this is what she said to me, and it struck me. She's like, his guys, who are a bunch of millennial pussies, turned him in and framed him for a crime he didn't commit. And I was like, didn't think you were going to go there, <laughs> but now I'm very interested to see what happened, because that is the last thing I expected. And, and obviously, the next question I had, which I couldn't ask her, is, well, boy, I really want to talk to these guys. Um, that proved much harder and took a lot longer because a lot of them were active duty and, and it just couldn't happen. But, you know, eventually I did learn and piece together more of the story. Right. And notably, you, Gallagher would never speak with you. That's true. Which is interesting. That's true. He spoke to his wife, but he would not, he would not speak with you. Well, that's, so that's really typical when someone is uh, charged with murder. The first thing that their lawyer says is shut up and don't talk to the, the press. Um, so I didn't hold that, a, you know, but after, by the time he was acquitted, I had already written enough about him that he didn't approve of that he wasn't going near me. And I actually, I'll tell you as an author, of course, as a journalist, you want to try and learn as much as you can. You want to talk to the people who are directly involved with things as possible. And so Eddie Gallagher is at the center of this whole story, right? But what I had learned over the process, um, of, of reporting, about him for several months as his trial went on and other things is, is that he lies constantly, constantly. He's one of those people we've all met. They don't only, ever, only lie to get themselves out of trouble, but they'll just lie about shit just because, invent some good story that never happened. He tells this story, and he's told it a bunch of times, um, about like, oh, like Mosul was crazy. I remember when we were walking through this one area that had been a park and there was an old playground and there's like children's heads like stuck on like spikes, like parts of the old park uh, there that ISIS had just left. I was like, whoa, that's hardcore. Um, so I went and talked to all the other guys in the platoon. They're like, never happened, <laughs> never happened, dude. So like I knew I couldn't trust him. Right. So as a journalist, that creates a problem, right? Because what if he had said, I call him up and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you. And he talks to me for 10 hours and tells me all sorts of stuff. And I don't know if I can believe any of it. Um, so I was like, no, doesn't matter. Figure out how to deal with that. Call him up anyway. Ask him if he'll talk to you. And I did. Uh, I actually called his lawyer. Um, and they said, not only no, but hell no, we'll not talk to you. Um, uh, and I got to be honest, as a journalist, I was like, or as a person, as someone who was going to have to tell the story, I was like, thank God, because I don't know how to do it. And so I thought, isn't the, the real story here is not what Eddie Gallagher says. The real story is there was a bunch of guys around Eddie Gallagher. Right. He was their leader. They had to react to all these things that he did, and they had to react in ways that were really difficult and led them through sort of a, a, a bureaucratic and cultural minefield of, like, what is right? And I thought... That's the more important story. So the more time you can spend on understanding those guys and how they had to work around this, the better. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the guys around him and, and the turning points in the story. So as, you're, as you narrate the story, there's, you know, there's the problems in training, right? He's shooting at cutouts of civilians and, and um, you know, people who aren't a threat and so on and so forth. Um, so there are already some worries about what's happened in training even before they get to Mosul. But then when they get to Mosul, the first thing in effect that happens is they turn their transponders off. Right. And he I, gives the order to turn the transponders off. So these, these things are like a tracker, just like you have on your iPhone that can show you where your friends are. Except they use them in battle so that everywhere on the battlefield they can see where the friendly forces are, and that way you don't get like shelled or or hit by a, a missile or something, and it, it, it's a big safety thing, especially in a place like Mosul where there's people coming in from all sides at the same time that there's fighters and drones overhead, artillery coming into certain places. So it's very important to know where you are. And so the reason that he did that, at least as you tell the story, is that they have been ordered to stay back. 
from the front, not right. to go into the fight right. and to give support from behind. Right. The, and he wanted to get in there, yeah. so he orders his men to turn their tractors right. off. Right. I, I, I think like the, the word from up high was you need to stay one click, a kilometer uh, behind the, the forward line of troops. You can advise the uh, Iraqis, you know, and if the Iraqis say, hey, we, we're going to go down here, we're going to need... Um, some drone coverage or mortars or whatever, you can help them with that, but you got to stay a kilometer back. And by He didn't want to do that. Right. He wanted <laughs> to be in the fray. So by doing that, he puts his own platoon in much greater danger. For sure. He exposes them to For friendly sure. fire. But they, they think that he's doing them a, a favor. They, they perceive it as... Here's another hookup from Eddie, who's really good at working the rules for, for us. You know, just as Eddie will help me cut the line to get into sniper school, Eddie, no matter what the higher-ups say, is going to let us turn our trackers off because he understands, like, we can't do our jobs back here. We don't want to sit around here uh, a, a kilometer away. We want to be right up on the front line, and so Eddie's going to let us do that. Okay, so now at any one of these points, and as the story goes on, there's another violation, there's another violation, there's another violation, and you paint the picture his commanding officer even knew about it. Nobody stopped him. Nobody reported him. Nobody, you know, said, nobody raised the question even, hey, Eddie, why are we doing this? This is a bad idea. Right? Why? Um... Commanding officer makes it sound really imposing, but in in the Navy SEALs, a platoon that deploys the the officer is usually significantly junior in, in experience and age to the oldest enlisted guy, and that's that's pretty common with 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 all um, small units of ground troops. You know, you're going to have someone who's been a soldier there for a long time knows the most, so, and that was the case here. Eddie Gallagher was the most uh, senior guy, um, the most experienced guy, the oldest guy. Technically, in the chain of command, um, there was was a guy a, a, above him, a guy named Jake Portier. But effectively, Jake Portier was kind of the uh, his assistant, his go between to uh, uh, other parts of the command elsewhere. And so, uh, Eddie was was running the team, and the team basically had to do what he said. So, why did they go along with it? Um, it goes. A little bit back to that culture of once you get into the SEALs and you realize that everybody's there as a SEAL, like you don't rate anymore. So they're all in combat. Eddie's been in combat before on, on previous deployments. He knows what he's doing. He's older. He's the boss. He's in charge. He's telling you to do something. So the last thing that you want to do is, is appear that you don't have the stomach for it or you're, you're not cool with breaking the rules. Because remember, the, the whole culture is all about if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Um, and so Eddie will do things that in a way seem like he's doing you a solid. Let's turn off our transponders. I know a great place up by the front line where, where we can get a lot of action. Um, let's uh, fire a shoulder rocket, shoulder fired rocket into that building, even though we are not totally sure that the, there's bad guys in there just because it's Mosul and there probably are. Um, he's, he's presenting himself and maybe thought of himself as like, hey, I am the insulator between you and the pointless desk jockey, pencil pushing bureaucrats back in the United States who don't really understand this conflict and don't understand what SEALs do. I'm going to be here to help you do your job. But then at some point, they had to know that he was either delusional. I mean, he, he's reporting, you know, shooting numerous ISIS fighters when he hadn't shot any. Right. right. And he comes back every day and he says, yeah, I got, you know, 15 of them. I got. Yeah. And they know it's not and, true. And I think and for a lot of these guys, like the delusion broke really quickly. Um, okay. But you might think at that point they would say, whoa, yeah. we're now officially in danger with a commander like this. Yes, right? yes. Um, so I think that for a lot of us haven't have had a really terrible boss, and if you haven't, get ready for it. <laughs> um, I think that a lot of them, like a lot of us, you know, 
the difference is we're talking about lethal force, but you know, it's like managing a bad boss. How do you manage around the weird things that they're doing and just try and make the best of it until people could no longer view it that way. Yeah. And so it would happen really quickly. I'll give you an example of a sniper named Dylan DeLay who was looking through his scope and um, watched uh, uh, just two old men standing by a corner. They had a, a jug where they were going to get water from the river because the water supply had been cut off in Mosul. Um, they were standing there talking, and he saw Eddie um, shoot one of them. Shoot him. So Eddie's 500 meters away, probably. Cold blood sniper shot, just downs him. And he's like, I understand that this conflict is gray and there are going to be a lot of people that are combatants that aren't armed, but that's just murder. And so he sees a couple more things like that, that, you know, he realizes like Eddie's not doing us a favor. Eddie's not clearing away the bureaucracy. Eddie's a murderer. And so his, uh, he has a kind of an unusual response. He's like, okay, I'm in Mosul. What am I going to do now that I know that my chief is trying to shoot old people, women, children? Well, I'm going to shoot warning shots. So whenever I see anyone walking down the street, I'm going to shoot in front of them, right by them, so that they run away. And if I can get them to run away, they'll be safe from Eddie. I will protect them from Eddie. Yet, yeah, meanwhile, they're engaging at a lot of firing of shots. Right. Which exposes their position. Right. Not to mention wasting right. a lot of ammunition. Right. So, I mean, right. he's not happy about this. He's infuriated that, like, this is why I'm sitting in a war right. zone, like, about to get killed, like, so that I can keep my boss, boss in place. from killing yeah. civilians. Right. But like, he doesn't know what else to do. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the danger is that if you, I don't know if this is just perceived or if it was actual, but the guys perceived that if you stood up to Eddie, if you did something to anger him, he could easily get you killed there in 10 different ways, right? Send you off on, on some assignment, ask you to go something he left off up on the roof uh, where he knew that like a sniper would get you. Uh, they thought that. And so there were a lot of guys who were like, I don't know what I'm going to do about Eddie, but whatever I'm going to do about Eddie, it's going to be when we get home. Uh, and in the meantime... What can we do to mitigate the harm he can do to civilians? So let's talk about, I want to get our audience in, um, but two more topics before we do. The first is the trial. Mm. Let's talk about the trial, because mm. one of the key witnesses, and I can just see the movie, this is going to be you know, incredibly dramatic someday up on screen, I'm sure, um, courtroom scene, where the critical witness, right, the medic, this guy, Scott, who's expected to testify, number one, that Eddie had told everybody over the radio, knowing that this ISIS prisoner was coming in, don't touch him, he's mine, right. he says over the radio. Shows premeditation, as you point out correctly. They expect him to get up and testify, and he doesn't. He doesn't say that. Now, he does testify, and God, this is a dramatic moment in the book, the pause, right, where he, he does end up saying that Eddie stabbed the guy. Um, but then he says, but I killed him. And he takes the fall and says, now, tell us about that. And this is like what you discovered. I was sitting, so I was sitting in the back of the courtroom when this happened. Everyone was, was, this was the best witness. The medic who had been right there when allegedly Eddie Gallagher stabbed this uh, prisoner three times right here in his neck. And um, one quick bit of backstory. Before this, to my knowledge, there had been two other um, SEALs that had ever been uh, charged with abusing or killing a detainee, uh, both since 2001. And in each case, uh, there was one witness outside, you know, uh, uh, some, not, some American military person who wasn't a SEAL who said, like, I saw this, this happened. And they would get up and testify and say, like, I saw uh, John Smith uh, beat this, this de detainee to death. But inevitably, the other witnesses in the room were SEALs. And they would get up and they would say, didn't happen. And so you'd have four people who'd say, didn't happen. One who said it did, the jury would acquit. That happened multiple times. This was different. This was, you had several people um, 
from the platoon get up and say, like, I saw this. He was shooting at civilians. I saw him shoot an old man. I saw him shoot a girl. Um, but this medic was going to be the key witness. He was closest on the day when they had an actual identifiable victim who actually died. And he was supposed to say and had said to the authorities multiple times, I saw him stab him three times in the neck. It was some serious wounds. And then he died. And instead he saw, said, yes, I did see him stab him in the neck, but it didn't seem to be serious. In fact, I believe, as a medic, that he would have kept on living, but I killed him. I covered his breathing tube, and he died. And so that, what he said there, immediately, it's like uh, something out of a TV drama, but never actually happens in a courtroom. And like of course, a, he had immunity, so a surprise. he wasn't exposing himself right. to risk of prosecution by saying So he was that. immune, and not only was he protected, but by saying the wound Eddie gave wasn't going to kill this guy, that protected Eddie from murder, potentially. Um, and uh, uh, I killed this guy, um, you know, for, definitely insulates him from murder. And so what he was trying to do, I think, I think, is um, when I, well, let me stop and, and go back. I think that maybe he was telling the truth when he said, I covered the breathing tube and I killed him. And I think that's true because imagine yourself, you're sitting next to a wounded enemy fighter. You've been told to give him some medical care. Your chief comes up and uh, stabs uh, this guy several times in the neck and then walks away. What would you do with this guy? You probably can't fix him at that point. You probably don't wanna just walk away and leave him. Um, I think that the most humane thing to probably do is just cover, the, he had a breathing tube in his neck right here, cover that tube until he dies. So I just like, okay, so I you could, know, so I he could knows see that. for sure that if he does that, he's potentially responsible right. for murder. That's the problem with that story. Right. That, that's, right. that's really right. a problem. Right, and so he, but he, so this, this medic that did this, I think what he thought is, I'm going to work out a deal that protects all of us. First, I'm going to get immunity because I'm their key witness. Of course, they have to give it to me. Then I'm going to say, yes, there was a stabbing, but it was barely a scratch. And then I'm going to take credit for the murder. Uh, it was almost like uh, like a mob case where uh, you know they, they give immunity to some stool pigeon, and then he takes the fall for all of the criminal activity. Um, but the... the the Navy lawyers who were doing it never saw it coming. They were dumbfounded, so dumbfounded that the prosecutor could barely finish his questioning of this, this uh, witness, and, and the whole case from there basically fell apart. So last, last issue I want to cover is what happened after the acquittal and, of course, the conviction on taking the photograph. Um, and Donald Trump's involvement, and, and sort of what that meant, as far as you could tell, to Trump's relationship with the Navy, mm. Navy leadership, sort of the undercutting of, of Navy leadership, really, on this. So, so once Eddie Gallagher gets acquitted, the Navy's got a problem, because a lot of the leadership thinks he did it. They think that it uh, not only did he... he uh, um, unlawfully kill people in, in, uh, uh, in Iraq, but he became like a star of, of conservative cable. He even went on cable right after he was uh, uh, acquitted. And so like, this is a problem because we can't have someone like representing our community who's like, yeah, um, I did this. And um, so they're like, what can we do? And the, the Navy SEALs, they decided, here's what we need to do to send a message. We're going to take away his trident. And the trident is, is a, a eagle-shaped pin that all SEALs get when they, when they complete training. And it, it's a huge point of pride. Uh, they said, we can do that administratively. We don't need a jury to do it. But that will send a message to the whole force. Hey, this guy is not one of us. He doesn't represent our values. He's out. So they start doing the paperwork to make that happen. Um, and Eddie Gallagher and his family and his supporters are like, 
oh, no, you're not going to do that. Uh, I am a SEAL, and I've got nothing to be ashamed of. You're just angry at me because you lost. And they found a big ally in the president of the United States. He got involved and said, they are not going to take away this pin from this man. Now, in a way, it's such a dumb little thing. I think you can get one of these at, at the base exchange for like seven bucks. Uh, um, but in a bigger sense, it was everything. Because uh, the, the military, there's always been this arrangement in the United States. Civilian leadership gets to tell the, leader, the military what to do. However, the military gets to do it in, in, you know, gets to run things how they want to run it. And, they're gonna, and they get to make those decisions, especially personnel decisions. And you don't want to politicize those decisions in the mili that military people make because that runs the risk of then making the military political. And once the military gets involved in politics, we ain't got a democracy no more. And so this right. $7 and pin right. actually represented like the most valuable things that we have in our democracy. Shall the leaders of the Navy be able to decide who de ethically deserved to wear that insignia? Um, or shall the president uh, come in and do what he wants? And there was a real standoff. And top admirals in, in like fancy offices with big oil paintings of ships on them in the, in the Pentagon were, were debating, like, what do we do about this guy? What do we do about this enlisted sailor and whether he gets to keep his pin or not? And the... Secretary of the Navy, Richard Spencer, said, guys, I got a plan. Um, I'm going to take away his pin. I'll do it. You guys don't do it because you're the military. I'm a civilian leader. I'll take away his pin. The president is going to then overrule me and fire me, which is fine because, remember, I'm not military, so he's not, he's not getting involved in the military if he fires me and overrules my decision. But... That will send a message to the rest of the SEALs saying you don't deserve to wear that trident. So you will get the good order and discipline part. <clears throat> President Trump will get to feel like he gets to do what he wants. I will be that weird person in the middle who is a civilian but neither the executive nor the military, and I'll be the circuit breaker to protect this. So the guys in the Pentagon are like, give it a try, yeah. And so Spencer tries to make that happen. And President Trump's people are like, oh, no, you won't. You're not going to take that away, and then we'll give it back. You're just not going to do anything because you're fired. <laughs> and so Eddie Gallagher got to keep his pin. The Navy had to, and I think that this really uh, in Navy leadership is a big deal to this day, had to like back off. Because if they say anything, they make it worse. If you are the admiral leading the Navy and you say, like, I can't believe he just did that. That was a terrible idea. You're going to get fired too, well, and it's just going to escalate. Their so they the choose they they choose very wisely to de-escalate, but they believe that damage has been done. Um, well, and it wasn't the first time that Trump had clashed with even specifically Navy leadership, right? There was the right. coronavirus, right? The captain, right, the right, right. And he and he hinted before Eddie Gallagher's trial that he'd probably. Um, uh, pardoned him if he was convicted. We never got there because he wasn't. Um, well, for murder. Right, for but murder. He commuted his sentence. He, he, for he commuted his sentence for, for um, taking a picture with a dead body. Um, and Eddie Gallagher not only uh, uh, went free, but he went to Mar-a-Lago. He, he hobnobbed with the folks there. Um, he's since been to a couple of um, uh, fundraisers for a couple of very sort of far-right uh, folks like Matt Getz and uh, Lauren Boebert um, of Colorado, uh, Matt Getz of Florida. Uh, he's kind of, in the last year, his, his star is kind of set. I haven't seen him do anything real public. Um, but so what's the lasting, these clashes that President Trump had with military leadership in there, and we could go on, right? There were a lot of them over, some over personnel issues, um, transgender in the military, policy and, and so on, um, you know, is there lasting damage from this, would you, you say? Know, in... I, as, as a journalist, I'm be very much better at telling you what happened than thinking about what might happen. But okay. I got to tell you, like, I think it put a lot of heat in the wiring. You know, this tension between intentionally making 
uh, military justice cases political for political gain. Um, that can put strain on a system, that can put strain on relationships between um, leadership at all levels uh, and, and civilian government. Like, now, did we have a coup? No, we didn't. But like, is that the type of stuff that, that can fray those relationships that have served us really, really well for 200 years? Yeah, uh, it does. And so I think that's why uh, people in upper leadership, like the, the SEALs, they call themselves team guys. The team guys, the guys who are in, in boots and, and working in platoons, they don't think about that, that, that stuff. But like the admirals think about it a lot. The team guys think about like, hey, I want Eddie out of the Navy because I don't want him to lead any of my friends. Like that guy sucks. <laughs> so, I don't want so, him to do that again. And the interesting again. thing here, David, is that it's not just a violation of the traditional relationship between the civilian head of the military, the commander in chief, and the uh, professional um, military leaders, but also when we're talking about criminal justice, mm. it's not just that the military shouldn't be politicized, but criminal justice shouldn't be sure. politicized, right? Sure. So we want our prosecutions to be free of political considerations. And that's, of course, problematic, especially when you you know, and so whether or not any of that played into the acquittal is another thing that we might think about. Right? You know, I, I think that's true, and I don't know. So I should say this about the acquittal. Like, there were so many things going on, um, one of which was that it's a jury that was not just all military, but all military with, with I think, with the exception of one with ground combat um, experience. So... Uh, you know, and they were being asked to convict a fellow ground pounder for killing an ISIS combatant. Like the, just like I'm, I'm sure it wasn't conscious, but just the bar that they would have to overcome to yeah. do that. You know, it would be like, I don't know, like if if a cop was being tried for killing a criminal, and uh, everybody on the jury was cops. Yeah. All right, so let's open up to our audience. Here we are, two civilians having a long conversation right? about the military. It always feels a little uncomfortable. And there are a lot of <laughs> military in the audience who can set us straight. Okay, and if you could introduce yourself uh, before you give your comment or question, that would be great. Go ahead. And there we have mi a microphone. Please take the microphone. Hi, uh, Bill Connors from St. Joe's Prep. Who should have been telling Donald Trump to not do this? And did they? Uh, so... Uh, who should have been, I, I believe probably the closest person to him would either have been a Secretary of Defense or uh, Mike Milley, who's, who uh, runs things. And Milley did talk to him personally and say, sir, don't get involved in, in this, this uh, argument over the pin. It's tribal. You don't want to go there. And, you know, I, I think it wasn't the first or the last time that he disregarded Milley's advice. Hi, thank you. That, that was so interesting. Uh, so you can introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, first. Yes, sorry. Um, I'm Beatrice Wilson. I am a graduate student in Russian and East European students and one of Dr. Finkelstein's national security law students. I have been following your reporting about the drug culture in the SEALs with some interest over the past few months. And in your book, you say that Eddie Gallagher was abusing drugs and, in fact, had a junior SEAL buy drugs for him. Can you talk some more about how that? The, these illegal dr drugs influenced the entire situation with Gallagher and how you see it as continuing to influence the SEALs today? And we so, should also say that Beatrice is herself in ROTC. Oh, got it. Um, no. Oh, oh uh, uh, yeah. so, so just some background. Eddie Gallagher was had gotten hooked on uh, opiate painkillers uh, in the Navy at first legitimately and then ultimately illegitimately. Uh, and it, it was an arc that very much followed what happened in the rest of civilian America. Um, but he was actively doing those while he was uh, over in Iraq. Uh, he was also using um, performance-enhancing drugs, most notably testosterone, um, and probably also uh, a drug that they used to, to, for energy to stay awake during missions. Now, how all of that stuff effect, affected his decision-making, I don't know. Um, there's a separate answer that, or thing that you raised that I want to recognize that's, that's really different. So, so I don't know how it went into his decision making and it never came up in trial, um, but certainly it probably wasn't helpful. Um, 
this, the Navy SEALs uh, selection course, which is called BUDS, uh, I, I've written a couple stories about in the last six months. And the stories are all based around how um, the leadership there has found that there's a significant amount of people using performance enhancing drugs there. Um, and how that's led to a number of issues, including some people getting seriously injured, and not by drugs, but by the dynamic it created, and and one um, sailor dying. Uh, that is interesting because it has some some ethical implications. So remember, you ain't treat cheating, you ain't trying. Um, I think that a lot of people that go into buds are like. This is insanely hard and insanely competitive. Only 30% on average who enter get through. Why wouldn't I seek advantage? Uh, and by the way, they're not testing. So why wouldn't I seek advantage? Um, but that raises an interesting ethical question, right? Because if you are selecting in your elite commando forces, if you are selecting for the people who are willing to cheat to get through the selection course, then who you're selecting for is cheaters. Um, and I'm not saying that all of the people who get through are, are using performance enhancing drugs. I, we don't know how many are. Um, uh, but enough are getting through that, that it was a problem. And now I've, I've talked to dozens of, of BUD students since who, who said that it was, it was fairly pervasive and, and may still be. So uh, that's, a, that's a problem that's both you know, a, a distinctly modern problem because 20 years ago it was a lot harder to get all this stuff. Now you can get it on the internet. Uh, but also a cultural problem. You know, if you believe that, like, if you create a program that's almost impossible to get through, make it very selective, and make failing out extremely distasteful, um, then these guys have a lot of uh, reason to uh, cheat to get through, and that's that's what's happening. So. What they've done in, uh, in response is they're starting to do some testing. I don't know how much, and I don't know how effective it's going to be. I don't know if, they've, if those problems are, are ongoing. Uh, hi, David. I'm John Sauter. Uh, I'm a retired physician, and I was an active duty physician in the Navy 30 years ago. Um, the SEALs in, in Eddie's unit went to his, uh, well, first, let me say, you write with real compassion and real um, regard for our military personnel, and I really appreciated that. Thanks. Um, the, the SEALs in Alpha Platoon went to their um, commanders, and they were rebuffed. And then they went to another level, and they were somewhat rebuffed above them. And uh, here's my question. These um, fellows, that these, the things that we ask Navy SEALs to do and other special forces, a lot of it we don't even know about. And how often do these people who were in the commands above him were asked to do things that they can't talk about and nobody can admit to because maybe they knew that they were breaking the rules. Like we ask these Great. people to do things that are almost beyond our comprehension and never become public. Um, so... Speak to that issue uh, that these guys uh, who were tasked with following up on these complaints really were yeah. put in uh, a, an ethical conundrum. So um, for background, uh, the, the junior SEALs who are in, the, in this platoon try to turn in their, uh, their chief, Eddie, to the chain of command. First to the troop commander, then to the person above that. They go to one of the senior enlisted guys. They never get anywhere with it until they go outside of the Navy SEALs to NCIS, the, essentially the cops. Um, uh, why is that? Um, so I was never able to speak directly to any of those leaders who seem to have not done anything. But I think that there are a couple different things going on. One, there's a good possibility that Eddie had dirt on a couple of them. And so they couldn't very well turn in Eddie because who knows what, what uh, that would do. Um, the other is that I think that out of a sense of brotherhood, a couple of the enlisted guys were going to try and fix this quietly. Like, hey, if Eddie is uh, a crappy leader, if Eddie doesn't deserve to be a SEAL, like, we're not going to call the cops on him. We're just going to get him, like, you know, quietly moved out of the Navy. And I think that they tried to do that. We're maneuvering him to, like, sit at a desk for another year until he was, was good for retirement, and then they'd make him go away. You know, think of it like, 
basically any organization with a, a high level of public regard and low transparency will do that. Catholic Church, universities, like it happens. The SEALs aren't immune to that at all. Um, and I think that they were trying to make that happen with Eddie. Just sideline him. Um, make sure he can't do any damage, and then he can go and collect retirement. Uh, and I think while they were doing that, the guys in the platoon perceived that nothing was happening, that, that Eddie was going to keep moving up, that he was going to have more influence, that he was going to come after them. And they felt like, look, all we can do here now is call the cops because the adults in the room, the people that we went to for help, uh, aren't doing anything. And I think to an extent, there were some people trying to do something um, without alerting authorities, and there are some people who were doing nothing. There's uh, one in the front here who maybe you can't see. Uh, hi, my name is Liam. Um, I'm a freshman here at Penn. Um, and, you know, since we're in the Center of Ethics, I was wondering, um, how, how do you approach writing about ethics um, when ethics is a very, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, relative term. Right. right. If I bring a... Um, random person from from china right and then i you know because that's where I'm, I'm born and and i bring them to the united states and i ask him to do the same thing as um someone he's you know never done things with it's it's very hard for them to do the same exact things right so we have this idea that ethics is tribal ethics is what the general populace thinks mm. so then how do we apply our general level of ethics onto a group that Right. really doesn't necessarily need any ethics in the way that we perceive it because they do things that are by nature almost unethical. You know, I so I think that there's a really, I, I, I think it's a great question. First, let me say, uh, I think that there's often a uh, perception in the civilian world that war is is the absence of ethics, right? Because there's killing, there's lethal force. It's like the first and thing that we're not supposed to do. But actually, I think that that war is is not the lack of ethics, but the like crazy expansion of ethics. Because in any given day, you will have the chance to take a life and save a life. And most of us sitting around in the civilian world, we do neither of those ever in our whole lives, right? But that could happen minute to minute for them. And there there are chances to be um, uh, both heroes and devils. And so I think actually if you spend a lot of time with military people, you'll find that they think about ethics and act on ethics much more than the rest of us do, which is really surprising, but it's cool to see. Um, so uh, that brings us back to like your idea of like, well, what is ethics really and what's right and wrong? That's why it was so interesting to write about this. Because these guys who are about your age are asking these same questions that you're asking. When one group of guys all has a certain way of thinking about something uh, as right or wrong. Um, and then there's a whole other set of rules back home that are different. Um, and you have to decide. There, there was no clean way through it. If I turn in my chief, I betray the brotherhood. So like, I don't, I don't get to only do a good thing. I have to do good and bad, right? Um, if I don't turn in my chief, I also betray the brotherhood. Um, it was, was very tricky. And I got to tell you, lots of guys made very different, um, decisions here. There were some guys who said, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what happens to me. Doesn't matter what happens to Eddie. What he did is wrong. We need to let the system know so they can prosecute him. There are other guys who who are like, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you, but like, I don't want to get, uh, you know, have it impact my career. And then there were some guys who were like, no, man, like that guy who killed was, was just a dirtbag who would have killed us if he had a chance. And like, I don't really care. And, you know, the fact that the rule book says that it was against the rules, like, would I have done it? No. But am I going to fry a chief over it? No, I'm not going to do that either. So, uh, and I'm sure there are some people in the platoon, I didn't talk to him, but I'm sure there are some people who thought it was cool as hell. So like, you have these guys who are all trying to navigate ethics, and it's not like, it ain't multiple choice, man. Like, you have to check the wrong answer and the right answer at the right same time, and just hope that you can make your way through it. And it's really tough for them 
And I'm sure that some of them still wonder if they did the right thing or not. In fact, I know they do. Uh, and, and wonder is a nice word for it. And Liam, if I can also take a minute to, to address your question, because as a professor of ethics and someone who studies the law of war, uh, uh, you're asking a good question about cross-cultural ethics and, you know, what's ethical to one person is not ethical to another and, and so on. How do we think about that? Well, number one, I would say to you that here we have very clear military law uh, and rules of engagement that are being violated. So we have straight up rule violations. It's not a matter of opinion, right? So where's the ethics? The ethics lies in how you situate yourself relative to the rules, right? And, and how you make those personal decisions and, in Eddie's case, those leadership decisions, right? About, um, you know, how you're going to implement the rules, how you're going to stick to them whether you're going to violate them in certain cases, because there are always cases in which it may be ethical to violate the rules. But in a case in which you're not being, you are not leading in an ethical way, okay, you are not leading your troops or you are, you know, or you are a business executive and you are not leading your company or you in any situation um, where you are not leading ethically, you are placing those under your care in jeopardy emotional and, in this case, physical jeopardy. And, and that's not a cultural relative matter. That's across the board, right, in, in any system. So my two cents on that. Who we got? My name is Richard Salkowitz. Um, frequently in, among the Penn community, my wife is part of Penn. Uh, my question is that we have elite forces in each of the services. The Army, Special Forces, the Marines have something. I suppose the Air Force does. Does this culture that you're describing for the SEALs carry over to any Special Forces group? What do you know about that? Um, so I should say that I don't think that, I think that Eddie Gallagher is a one-off. I think you shouldn't expect to see um, every platoon that goes somewhere, you know, it's the, the boss of a platoon ends up murdering someone. That's unusual. It's a, it's a tip of a larger iceberg of, of, of a subculture of, of sort of criminal violence. But to what extent does the Navy SEAL ethos, training, approach to things rub off. Um, I'm not great, a great person to, to um, answer that, but I will tell you one place where I think it does, and I'm, I'm not sure it's a good thing or not. So I mentioned that they have this really hard selection course called BUDS, um, uh, where 70% um, of people on average, sometimes often more, um, wash out. Um, the, the SEALs see that absolutely as a point of pride. And if you're not washing out 70%, like how do you know you're getting the right people? Um, that absolutely has, has uh, trickled down to other um, special operations folks, even other special operations folks in the Navy, where they, they increasingly design courses that have really high attrition rates, um, uh, which has all sorts of implications. One, obviously, is cost. You have to enlist and bring in a whole bunch more people, run a bigger school, uh, even though you know you're going to throw most people out. Like, imagine if Penn failed 70% of its students. Um, you guys probably write to the dean if you get a C. <laughs> uh, two, a lot of people. A C, we don't get I know, right? That's why. Uh, uh, two, a lot of people get hurt uh, in that process. Uh, and then again, Uncle Sam's on the line, because if like you uh, uh, break your neck in training, um, you get medically retired and you get VA and, and it's paid for for the rest of your life. So, um, but it's also very attractive, right? Because like if you're in, if you consider yourself an elite force, then you're always looking at, are, are we more elite than the other elite forces? And so to a certain extent, there's a little bit of an arm race of like, well, how nasty can we be to the people that want to join uh, in order to make sure that we're getting really elite people? And 
there's obviously a value to having a, 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 a tough qualification course, but at some point there's a curve, right? Uh, and where you start to lose value or, or uh, maybe quite fast. I don't know where that curve is, but the other courses definitely have taken a lot from the SEAL course and, and tried to use it. So David, I want to spend, we have about 10 more minutes. I want to pivot to another topic yeah. just at, at the end of our discussion here, which is another piece of reporting, incredible reporting that you did um, in the last few years. You wrote a series of four or five articles in the New York Times about civilian casualties um, incident to our, our use of drones, uh, uh, particularly in, um, in Syria. And, mm -hmm. Syria and Iraq. And Iraq. Against ISIS. Right. And so same time period, right, as we're talking about with the Gallagher story. Right, right. A completely um, a different issue of, in this case, collateral damage, not mistreatment of, right. uh, of a detainee. Um, do you, what relationship between the topics um, do you see? Is, did you uncover with all the sort of path-breaking, <clears throat> ground-breaking uh, reporting on collateral damage that you uncovered, any of the same attitudes that led to the Gallagher story, or, or is it really a different topic completely? Um. So these were a bunch of stories about all the airstrikes that we did against ISIS in 2016, 17, 18, and it was tens of thousands. Um, we didn't want to put a lot of troops on the ground. We were supporting the uh, local forces that were fighting more ISIS, and you know, how do we do that? We provide overwhelming firepower from above. Um, drones, fighter jets, even B-52 bombers were in there. Um, and, and what we found is that the the military didn't know how many civilians it was killing, and it was killing a lot. Um, now, is that different? In a lot of ways, it's completely different. These, this, this air war was happening at the same time in the same place as this platoon of SEALs was on the ground. But the platoon really never had any interaction with it at all, um, you know, except for maybe one of the guys whose job was to talk to aircraft. They didn't see it. They didn't know how it worked. Uh, the, you know, the only thing that they saw of it was, was the smoke on the horizon. But um, likewise, what was different is the SEALs were doing killing very up close. You could look at the people that you were killing. You knew when they were killed. You were using small weapons. Um, the killing that was happening from the air was different because uh, a lot of times they had no idea when they were killing someone or not. If you drop a... a 2,000 pound bomb on a six story building because there's an ISIS fighter on the roof, how many people do you kill? You don't know. And, and likewise, the, what was motivating it was different. So it wasn't because there was a platoon chief who, who wanted to be able to tell people back in California that he had killed someone. It was a, that there were rules that were set up and the rules allowed, uh, this to happen. And I'll tell you really quickly how that works. So there are rules set up to make sure that this never happened. They were very strict. If you're going to do an offensive airstrike, you need to watch that area with a drone for hours to make sure there's no civilians going in and out. You need to have positive identification that the person you're targeting is actually an enemy. And you need to get a two-star general to sign off on it before it happens so that we're not just like shooting like a bunch of cowboys. Well, that was so onerous that the people who were conducting the war in Syria were like, by the time we get that, that strike approval, like the need for a strike is gone. So they had a brilliant idea. They're like, you know what, though? We have the inherent right to be able to fire missiles, drop bombs uh, in self-defense. And self-defense means, of course, if, if there are enemy troops coming towards American troops, that's self-defense, right? No problem. We can hit that. But what about if it's enemy forces coming towards uh, Syrian friendly troops? Well, sure, that's self-defense. We can do that. No problem. So we can hit those. Well, what about if there's a uh, suicide, uh, suicide truck full of explosives that's coming towards this, those Syrian troops? Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. Well, what if the truck is parked like two, three miles away? Can we do that? Still self-defense. No problem. We can do that. We don't need to call up the general. We can just hit that. What about if the truck is being not loaded with with 
explosives yet, but it's at the place where we know they load uh, explosives, and that's 30 miles away. Self-defense, we can do that. Okay, what if we figure out who the guy is who runs that factory where those are, and we hit his house? Is that self-defense? That's self-defense, too. So pretty much, they, they figured out a way to pencil with it so that they could completely step around all of the offensive strike-like limits and, and do these strikes. And instead of using a two-star general and lots of observation, they were a lot of times using like a E7, E8 Delta Force guy, or like enlisted special operations guy, um, sitting in a room who could make those decisions in you know, a minute or two and have no oversight whatsoever. And so in a way, they were trying to do the right thing, right? Enable us to uh, protect this par partner force, work with them, clear ISIS out, um, which everyone wanted to do, but the, because they circumvented all the safety uh, uh, valves, um, they were biased towards launching and they killed a lot of people who they didn't even know were there. Andrew, David, I want to stress that this, this playing creative interpretation, shall we say, of the rules of self-defense and the concept right. of self-defense. This is not a military invention, of course. This is, you know, all my kids do this all the time. Well, no, but also there were there were memos from the Office of Legal Counsel yeah. that set out these broader conceptions of self defense. Yes. And that were designed for particularly the purpose that that they were used for. Right. Um, which is to avoid some of these difficulties. And that's another talk we could have sometime. Uh, yeah, and I should say that I didn't find uh, we looked a lot and we didn't find anyone who was like trying to kill civilians, but we found like a lot of really bad intelligence, you know? So they'd say like, oh, this, this um, school is used to store um, explosives for ISIS. And we know that from this human source on the ground. Great, hit it. And it turns out, that was no. Wrong. It was a wedding party or- a Yeah, and, and I mean, that happened so, repeatedly. And, and one of the things I'll, I'll just mention and, and we'll end in just a minute, but one of the things that really blew my mind in talking to you about this is, you know, I had spent a lot of time arguing during those years that the CIA shouldn't be running the drone program. It should be a military drone program. Mm. There was a shift. At one point, the CIA's um, uh, targeted killing program was much larger than the military's, and Obama eventually managed to get it more into military hands. And, and you have said it was actually more precise when it was in CIA hands? Well, so that's what... I talked to a number of drone pilots who worked with both the CIA and with, this is a terrible name, but Talon Anvil. Talon Anvil is this, this super secret uh, st strike cell that did all the, the strikes in Syria. So they said, well, we, I worked first for CIA and then I worked for Talon Anvil. Um, and CIA was way more careful. They would watch something for weeks, months. They'd establish a pattern of life. They wouldn't strike near you know any other civilians. They're, they had a very low... Um, you know, threshold for how many civilians you could kill. Whereas Talon Anvil, it had it. There was a classified number of of civilians you could kill going after a target, and it was a sliding scale depending on how valuable your target was. But they're like, we would do it all the time. You wouldn't wait for anything. It was just like boom, 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 um, and it happened constantly. And I think one of the things that allowed that to happen is there was no mechanism or no effective mechanism for reports of, of civilian casualties to get up to policymakers. Um, they had like an office in place um, that couldn't, wasn't allowed on the ground, uh, didn't have any way to interview locals, um, basically just watched the drone footage. Well, when you level a building, you can't tell how many people are in there. So like there was no one saying to policymakers, hey, like yesterday we killed 100 people. Um, and so we should like figure out what's going wrong here. And so it just continued. So the granularity of your work in this area is absolutely extraordinary. I know we're going to have you back again uh, because you really put, um, you know, leaves on the trees for all the mm. things that we try to look at from a more theoretical academic perspective, as do the military partners that we work with. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. So uh, everybody, please join us for a reception. Uh, and book signing uh, in David's honor, and join me in thanking David Phillips for joining us.